this morning's uh, message, my caption is come, take, learn. Come, take, learn. And the reason for this caption is because these are the main things I'll be talking about. Coming to Jesus, taking his yoke and learning his life. So those are the main things I'll be talking about. Let's read it once again. Matthew 11 from verse 28 to 30. It says that come to me all you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. I, I believe that every one of us really understand what pain, suffering, and trouble is. If you have lived in this world for some time now, which all of us have done, you, you can really no, you know what pain is. You know what suffering is. You know it. You, you, you've experienced it, so you know what it is. And Job 14 verse 1 tells us that the life of a human being is so short, but full of trouble. Job 14 verse 1. Now, this passage here is a passage that Jesus himself speaks of. And what I want us to look at today is to look at it in three main sessions. The first part is verse 28, where he talks about coming, coming, coming. And throughout scripture, we, we see Jesus calling people, bidding people to come, calling people to come. In John 7, the verse 37, Jesus Bible says that Jesus stood out one day in a crowd and he cries out, Come to me, all you that thirst. And out of their bellies, he says, who flows the rivers of living water. In, in John 6, verse 37, he says that all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. John 6, 35. John 6, 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Isaiah 55. And I want us to read that one. Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 55, the verse 1 to 3. This is again another call to everybody, every human being. And the Bible says that come, come. It's like a, a man standing somewhere and bidding people to come. He says, come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you, and you who have no money, he says, come. Buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money. This, 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 thing, this offer, he's not asking for money. He says, all you need to do is to come. He says, come without money and without cost. What, what an invitation. What an invitation. So imagine... You have a, a friend who is organizing a party with dignitaries. And he just calls you, gives you an impact. The brother come. With no conditions attached. This morning, one of the things we are seeing, let's, let's read on from verse 2 of Isaiah 55. He says that, why spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good. 
and you will delight in the riches, riches of faith. So we find that Jesus is that welcoming. He is so welcoming. You would expect that a man of his status will be inviting people, giving conditions attached. Will be inviting people and say, okay, you come, righteous ones. You come, holy ones. You come, those who haven't sinned before. But he just throws the invite, come. And I am amazed at the caliber of people Jesus invites here. Verse 28, he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And I started by saying that every one of us really understands what it means to be under a burden. And this burden spoken of here is not a burden where you are physically tired. It is more of the weariness of your soul. It's about you being tired of the burdens of sin. And every one of us who is struggling to, who is trying hard to please God, knows how difficult it is to work your way in pleasing God. So this, this, this is talking about the, the burden and the, the labor that a person goes through when he tries to please God by himself. Because the Jews were used to the laws of Moses. And all they knew was that you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do this, don't do this one, don't do that, and then you'll be right with God. And that was such a burden for them. And if you've been trying to please God on your own, you understand how difficult that is. And all of a sudden, a man comes in and he says that, leave all those things, leave all the pressures of working hard to please God, leave all the burdens of sin, trying so hard by your own to, to, to have a closer walk with God, and come to me. What an offer. What an offer. You may be trying so hard this morning to please go by yourself, but it doesn't work. The way is this. Jesus does invite. Come. Come to me. And then the third part still of verse 28, he speaks of a rest that he gives those who come. And I, I was just thinking about what does it mean when he talks about giving people rest? What's all Jesus talking about when he says, I will give you rest? And I think that he's talking about the fact that when you come to him, you cease from laboring using your own strength. He becomes your strength now. For anyone who comes and commits to Jesus, he works things through you for you to be right with God. It's no longer about how much work you do, it's about how much work he does through you. How much work he does through you. So come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But what does it mean to come to Jesus? What does it mean to come? Is he talking about just moving to a place? What, what is he talking about coming to Jesus? What, what does he mean? And over here, he means that making a deliberate decision that I want to follow him. That firm decision in your heart that I want to live my life for him. It's about coming to him in your heart, making that 
firm decision that I want to surrender my whole life for him. I want to live for him. And the truth is that unless you come to an end of yourself, there's no way you can come to Jesus. You can. If you are still holding on to a part of yourself that is so much cherished that you wouldn't want God to touch that part of your life, you can't come. So this morning is an invitation thrown by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that come to me, make a decision. And I'm surprised that he's not even asking people to come to church, though we have to come to church as well. But more than that is he wants us to come to him himself. He wants a fellowship. There are people who come to church who haven't still come to Jesus. They, 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 they enjoy the fellowship. They enjoy the, the, the gathering. They enjoy the love among God's people. But they haven't committed to Jesus. And Jesus is saying this morning, that come. Come. I, I want to explore the, the, the credibility of the person speaking to you. Sometimes we don't take people serious if they have no serious credentials. In verse 27 of the same account, Matthew 11, it says that my father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the son except the father. And no one truly knows the father except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal them. You see, there, there is there's nobody that gives an access to God except this person who is giving this invitation. That, that's how credible he is. He claims that everything in this world is under his authority. He says that my father has entrusted everything to me. Everything in this world is under his authority. He answers to nobody. That, that's the person we are talking about. He doesn't answer to report to anybody on earth except the Father. And he's the one that, he says that those that I choose to reveal the Father to, they are the ones who can know him. That's the kind of power this person inviting us has. Think about it for a moment. I, I think of Jesus and I'm like, God, this is a man who lived 2,000 years ago. Over, over 2,000 years. And till date, there are not, there, there's so much songs written about this man than any human being just, just think about it. When we count time today, we speak of time in reference to him. We say 300 BC. What, what do we mean? We are speaking of time in relation to him. When we speak of time, we're talking about 300 AD in reference to his death, his birth. Everything is just being traced up to him. Without gun, this man never took gun all his life. Without joining any political party, today every one person out of three people you take in this world willingly, they've not been forced, they willingly. What, what a leader! What an impact! And this is a person inviting us. We have to be very careful that we don't just ignore or reject this offer. Because there's, there's no offer again we can ever get as this. As this. Then in verse 20, 29, he goes on to say, Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. 
For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. When we come to Jesus, that's just the start of point. That's just the beginning. He gives an offer that come, I will give you rest, but that's not all. He insists that when you come, there is something that you have to take upon you. And this morning, I, I, I just prepared a short PowerPoint to illustrate how yoke is. For us to see what yoke, that's a yoke. That's a yoke. That's a yoke. It's used to join two wolves. So, can we go to the next slide, please? That's right. So, that's a yoke. So, the yoke is a wooden structure joining the two wolves there. And the master is seated on that wagon leading or driving the two bulls where they must go. What, what does that mean to us? He's talking about submitting to my lordship. So over here, if the master thinks that the bulls are not going in the direction he wants it, he uses a means to redirect them. Either a rope, he pulls them back, or if they think that they are not moving, he strikes. And then off they go. Hallelujah. So, these two bulls here, they are submissive to the leadings of this master seated in this wagon. And Jesus says here that when you come to me, I want to be your Lord. I don't want people who just come to me and want to still live by the way they like. I want to be your Lord. I want to be your leader. In the book of John, John chapter 6, I think we need to be worth reading that passage. John 6. One, we see that Jesus does a miracle and he, he feeds 5,000 people just with small loaves of bread and, and two fish. He, he feeds so many people, 5,000 people. And then what happens is that after that incident, people were just coming, following him. People were just Crowd, crowds were coming to follow Jesus. But Jesus knew that these people, they are not coming because they want to submit to me. They are coming because the food that I gave them is for the authority. So, in verse let's look from verse 25 Jesus begins to speak very, very difficult statements to them. Very, very difficult statements. Let's look at verse 61. Verse 61. Aware, aware that these disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Does this offend you? Let's move back to verse 50, 54. Now, that's where I really want us to look at. Verse 54. It says that whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. What? <laughs> and I will raise them up at the last day. Eat your flesh, drink your blood. Verse 55, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. 
Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Jump to verse 61. Verse 61 of verse 60 says that on hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware of this, his disciples were grumbling about this. Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has an ego then. The 67, 66. From that from this time, many of his disciples they turn back and no longer follow him. They turn back and they, they cannot take that statement. Eat your flesh, drink your blood. They won't take it. They won't have that. They won't take it. We want the food. But your flesh, no. We won't have that. And there are many of us, many of us like that today. We want what he offers. But if it is something that we don't want, and he offers that, we would not ask him. So we really want him as a savior, but as Lord, no, no, we don't want that. And he says here that when you come to me, you have to take my yoke and learn from me. You have to take my yoke, which means you have to submit to my authority. It's no longer about you. When I say this is right, you must admit that is right. When I say this is wrong, that must be your definition of wrong. When I say this is how life ought to be lived, you mustn't say, oh no, no, no I think it should be this way. Then he's not your Lord. He's not your Lord if that is how you'll be going to live with him. So he says that anybody that comes to me must come under me, must take my yoke, must take my yoke. And the interesting thing about Jesus is that he not only places on you yoke to just go. He doesn't just give you belly and say, go on. He bears it together with you. So he's both the master over there. At the same time, he's the co-laborer with you. So he feels how you feel in life. When you, 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 you see, what do you think that when you cry from pain in life, do you think God doesn't see you? Or, or he, doesn't, he doesn't understand what it means to be in pain? Do you, have you ever thought that, oh God, God, you don't know what I'm going through. Have you ever thought that sometimes we don't say this time, but we feel, we think that, God, you really don't understand the pain I'm going through. That's how we feel. Now look, he bears the yoke with you. He's the one tied up with you in the morning when you wake up and it's like, oh, it's crashing down. You want to give up in life. He, he, feel, he feels sin. He feels sin. But when, when you are hurt from relationship and spouse and so on, and, and, and your heart is bleeding, he's bleeding as well. At the same time, he is the master seated over there, which directing you go this way. No, don't go that way. Go this way. Stop. No, 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 no. That's the wrong path. No, no. Come this way. Yeah. 
do this one. Stop here. This is the time to stop. He's leading you. At the same time, he is your equal. Bear with you the pain and pressures of life. I always tell friends that if you think the yoke of Christ is heavy, try that of Satan. Try that of sin. You do that. The Christ's yoke is not yoke. It's, it's not burden. Real burden is when you are in guilt of sin, when you know that if your life ends today, there's no future. And you have to walk through life with that torment all your life. That's real burden. This is not burden at all. Many think that oh, when I come to Jesus, I will not be free to do what I want. And that is the thing, that's the problem for you. The living of the life of self is the burden of man. Hallelujah. Good God. Like my heart is just pouring out with this, with this, this message. But that's not all. You don't just take his yoke. That's not all. Back to the same account. He says, take my yoke, and there's something more. What is next? What is, what is more? What, can somebody tell us what's more in addition to the yoke that is supposed to be taken? Lame. Lame! There is a school that must be a road into. You have to come to the school of Jesus when you learn his way of life. Lame. So he's not only asking that you take his yoke, he's saying that after taking my yoke, you have to come for me to school you about how to live life. There is a school that the word lame used there it is similar to the word disciple. Disciple. Which means that Anybody that comes to Jesus must be ready to be taught and groomed by him. He will not have people who just come who don't want to learn his way of life and apply it to their life. He will not have such people. He says that come, take my yoke and learn from me and what is it he's asking us to learn? Or what is it about him that we can learn from? He says that learn from me, for I, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. So, let's explore that phrase, I am gentle and lowly in heart. Because that will give us a very good understanding of what it means to learn from Jesus. In simple terms, I am gentle and lowly in heart. Simply means I am humble. I am humble. So when we come to Jesus, the first thing we need to learn from Him is His humility. That's, that's basic. Because without that, the school will not happen. We cannot learn from Him with our pride. The first thing he requires that you drop before you enroll in his school is that drop your pride. Drop yourself, drop that self, drop that I, I, I know this, I feel this way. I. He says that learn from me because I am lowly in heart and I'm gentle. Now, the, the two words used there are very similar, but there's a slight distinction. When we say somebody is gentle, you see, when we say somebody is gentle, gentleness is not, it's not the way the person does things. It's more about the condition of the person's inner mind. My soul. If your soul is calm, it affects the way you relate, when you do things. Please do, do, we, do we go on and try to. So, 
So, when people are sad, somehow their souls are just down. Down, and it affects their mood. Gentleness of heart is talking about that inner, your inner man is so settled. It's so settled. You have that. It's like you've been set. Sometimes, all of you will agree, most of you will agree, if not all, that there are times that you are going somewhere and you, there's so much talk within you. There's so much argument within you. You are asking so many questions. Your mind is closed, yet your mind is going, your, your inner mind is going like, why, why am I going through all these things? Why, why? There's so much questioning inside you. It is the voice of your soul that's disturbed and worried and talking. There's so much going on. Gentleness of heart, on the other hand, is when your soul is so settled and calm. Situations look bad, but inside you are just calm. That's called gentleness of heart. Then, Humility, meekness. Meekness is how you relate to people as a result of that gentleness of heart. So because my inner man is so calm and I feel like I'm nothing without God. When I when I'm relating to people, I feel like, oh, this is this is a brother, this is a creation of God. I mean, this man has been. The rest that is mentioned there, Jesus gives it to you just by coming. By 29, this rest you will find for your souls as you learn from him. What does this mean? Philippians 4 6 tells us that we should be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication we should. Let our request be made known to God. And he says that when you do that, when you give your request to God without being anxious about it, the seven says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that peace will guide your heart and mind. That is the rest in verse 29. Let's read that verse in Philippians. Philippians 4. Philippians 4, the verse 6 and 7. If anybody gets their verse, please read it for us. Philippians 4, 
verse 6 and 7. It says that be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Then the sentence says that, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. So when, by, when Jesus says that, learn for me and you will find rest for your souls, he's saying that the more you learn from me, the more peace you have. Peace or rest for your souls. Peace, inner peace. Verse 28, we said that this rest means that you will see from laboring by yourself. He does it for you. But in verse 28, as you lay and walk with him, that's where you find peace. Then he doesn't need to argue or, or give us more reasons to follow him, but he does. In verse 30 of Matthew 11, he says that for, in other words, because my yoke is easy to bear. And my burden, I will give you a still light. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. First John tells us that the commands of God are not grievous. Surprisingly, the world thinks that the reason they will not come into Christ is because He will limit. What they want to do. But the Bible says that the burden we bear when we come into Christ is much, 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 much easier. It's much easier. It's much easier. This morning I want you to think about holy committing to Jesus if you haven't already. Is come to me all you that will be like every day, and I will give you rest. If you are someone here who has already committed to Jesus, 